and everybody. And from my side, or from your side, good evening, everybody. I want to thank Baruf. That was uh, I love that album that he was playing of Swami's music, uh, singing those chants, those bhajans, and and it conveys such a sweet devotional feeling whenever I listen to that, and it's very inspiring to me. And I thought it was a very good one to choose uh, as an introduction to today's topic, which is uh, feeling, uh, that aspect of consciousness of feeling. And I chose as the topic to, you might say, to uh, contrast it to what some people feel, because in, in, they don't, I mean, feeling, one of the aspects I would, I guess I'm trying to say of, the, of feeling that is expressed by some is emotion. And there's a difference between emotion and feeling. And let's explore that a little bit today, because I think it's a very important topic because you don't find any uh, saint, any great person of spiritual development uh, who uh, is uh, not joyful, not a, not doesn't have a developed feeling nature, and it it's always goes back to something Swami Kriyananda always used to say: a sad saint is a sad saint indeed. In other words, somebody who sadness, of course, is not a is you, you might say an expression of disappointment or rejection. And of course, that's not something that a great saint would, would express. You look at the lives of the great ones, and there's, uh, they have individual natures, the great ones, they, saints, uh, some are joyful. Now that was, of course, Paramahansa Yogananda was like that. He was a saint of joy. He was a saint of love, yes, but his, his essential nature was joyful. And so he just felt this exuberant joyfulness that was flowing out of him. Now, not all saints express themselves in that way. Uh, some were, were uh, more loving and you could, and, and I've met uh, some very, I figure, think of exalted souls that exuded a certain calm kindliness. You know, but that too is a feeling. But nevertheless, I think all of them probably enjoyed a good joke uh, and, and, and saw the humor in life's situation. And it always was this came from a sense of inner deep feeling. And it makes you realize or wonder actually that what separates, it's that quality that separates. Uh, humanity from being a robot or mechanistic. And I wonder, quite honestly, is it possible to ever, will mankind and scientists ever be able to develop a robot that can embody that quality of feeling? You know, you look at a robot, you see it's very, they make them highly intelligent. You can beat anybody in chess and other logic, games of logic, extreme logic. Yes, and I guess logic is an aspect of intelligence uh, or sort of in a mechanical way of all possibilities being uh, analyzed until you come to the one that works. Well, yes, but is that what it means to be human? A human, and it's an aspect of intelligence, maybe close to the mind, moan, buddhi, and then you go beyond those two and you come to those two more subtle ones, ahankara, that sense of ego, individuality, a sense of self. And what makes that manifest that really is this fourth aspect known as chitta, that ability to feel the feeling element of consciousness that, sub that brings subjectiveness to life. The, and of course, it's also, you know, it has positive and negative sides to that. It expresses itself, but it's, it's that quality of our ability to experience pleasure, satisfaction, enjoyment. You know, some of those are outward, but also empathy, compassion. And of course, it, as I said, ego, that sense of self-identity, intuition, that sense of I, that uh, makes us human. 
in other words and can a, can a robot embody that someday i swami used to say well if they ever could make a robot sometime in the far future it it would have to be you couldn't equate it to humanity and to a human unless it had the ability to be inhabited by a soul and, and uh, can mankind reach to that ability well i don't know but it's certainly not what we see today but this feeling aspect is is so uh, what you could say makes us human and it's expressed in different ways especially this feeling element and so that music and singing is something that is very expressive of feeling and in swami's case the music we were listening to there uh devotional the, a love devotion and you could feel that coming through that i mean through that through that music and so it's also uh without feeling we wouldn't have the ability to experience true joy true peace those true experiential realities that we talk about when we talk about meditation those aspects of god but it also we realize emotions can it be expressed or feeling can be expressed outwardly and you could say that is the criteria for the difference between emotion and pure feeling feeling is something that's inward it's felt inwardly it's not dependent outwardly and it doesn't go out and feeling is not doesn't have a direct opposite because it's not part of the waves to the degree that we feel it in other words i feel up and i feel down well, there's still an ego element in there but once we go beyond ego which you might say ego is a accompanies and one of the defining things that characterize emotion once we go beyond ego we feel then we are experiencing pure feeling but even through the ego we can experience we experience feeling but because it's waves we experience it in plus and minus ways and emotions typically when we think of oh a person's emotional oftentimes we're thinking of those negative sides of that uh, disturbed feeling you could say positive or negative you could say is disturbed but disturbed feeling directed outward into the world is you might say through the ego is what we speak of when we speak of emotions and the negative emotions of those things you could say you know you can say in anger and desire and fear and so on but you think it's those things that get us into trouble <laughs> and those things that are you know that you might say bring our life force down into the body and create trouble for us in the future because you know actually create karma for us is what it's doing but of course karma is not necessarily in its pure sense good or bad it's it's how we experience it but you could say it brings us suffering that karma we consider bad is those things that bring us pain and suffering and so emotions are those things are those expressions of feeling through the ego that eventually are going to bring us trouble and it's likes dislikes attachments desires frustrated desire which is also another word for anger these are the things they they are those emotional feelings that well up within us and it's feeling that's that feeling nature and it's going outward and this is something we need to realize that it's 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 the feeling is human and so a person thinks well if i didn't have emotions i'd just be a robot i'd be dead i'd be dead to the world so it's better to have some feeling than no feeling well yes i guess that's you could make an argument maybe for that but why not let's learn to be able to go beyond those outward expressions of feeling and and go for the real instead of counterfeit why don't we go for the real thing and so but nevertheless it is true that people they rather feel something rather than rather than nothing and, and yeah i would agree with that 
that's better, but yet it's only a step. And it's a mistake to think that feelings in themselves are, if you don't have any emotions, you're not going to have any feelings. That's not true at all. And so consequently, we need to think, how do we, how can we just separate those two? And how can we overcome that emotional reaction to life and, and begin to think in terms of feeling in its more pure sense. Now, even outward emotions that are, you might say more of a positive, you know, people, you know, people that, uh, uh, which we all do, which we all do, we, 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 something is pleasurable or pleasant, we have this outward reaction to it. That's, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's not bad. But Master would say, well, but you don't want to habituate yourself to those outward feelings alone. Yes, it's fun to laugh at a good joke, but too much laughter at a good joke makes you dependent on those. It's the outwardness that was, uh, we says, keep it in moderation. And I guess the point would be keep it under control. You could, and you could say that for negative emotions too. They're, they're not good, but if they're in our control, well, then maybe we can learn to be able to by getting control of that energy behind those emotions, whether positive or negative, we can then learn to channel them into, you might say, a more positive direction, just like uh, a habit or a stream. Think of something, you know, I would say in terms of, if you look at people who are, you might say, addicted to emotions, let's say positively, let's say people who are the life of the party, that are giddy, that are, you know, that are always very out, outward. And you even look at comedians, oftentimes comedians are very much an up and down in their consciousness. And sometimes they're very unhappy people when they're not making jokes because it's, it's their life force is going out and they're subjecting themselves to the waves of up and downs. And so they can be very moody. And even we've talked about in the past, moods are, in, are a result, natural result of too much outwardness in our emotional feelings. And Master had certain disciples in his ashram who were like to joke a lot, like to carouse and were outwardly that way. And he would advise, says, don't, don't be so outward in that way. Try to keep it under control. Yet, it doesn't mean you shouldn't laugh when you laugh, but let it be heartfelt from inside, an expression of, of pure joy, as, as Master was. Master used to have, tell jokes, and he would laugh and laugh and laugh. But there was a pureness of joy there. And it was never harmful or hurtful in, in, to other people. And I guess there's, I've heard people say, well, sometimes it just feels so good just to get it out there. You know, it's like you got everything bottled up. You know, you have your feelings bottled up. Some people are like that. You know, they, they're just too, they're afraid of letting it out. And so they just says, well, you better to let it out. Well, I guess if you let it out in front of a mirror, maybe that's one thing, but don't let it out in front of other people. So, because what happens this outward expression of emotional feeling can be like uh, bombs being set off. And especially if you direct those, and we know this as we've probably all done it at one time or another, we get angry, we direct it at somebody and we just feel regret afterwards because we know it wasn't a good thing to do. And so consequently, uh, sometimes you just feel that, you know, that frustration. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I felt sometimes somebody is just like, oh, I just want to, you know, say something to that person. And I restrain myself, just like we should. But sometimes you just go by yourself, yeah, dog, gonna, you know, and, and yes, you're getting it out of your system. I don't, you know, sometimes it's just a relief. You know, when you have an emotional relief of any sort, that you just have to just have to say something, do something, and hopefully <laughs> without harming anybody else, it does feel a certain pleasurable feeling. Relaxation comes when you release tension, just like when you tense the body real hard, and then whew, you let the tension go. You feel that sense of relief that allows you then to go deeper into it. 
Emotions are a little bit like that too, but you don't really get rid of that emotional feeling by doing that. You just postpone it and it comes back again and again. Ultimately, we need to be able to transcend that. And But primarily, my point here is in if you find yourself subject to emotional release uh, in a negative way, don't aim it at somebody else because that's where you cause the trouble. You see, you cause you've hurt other people, uh, subjected them, you could say, and ultimately you've damaged yourself because uh, the karmic pendulum will ultimately swing. And so you have to keep it within control. But better yet, of course, is learning to overcome that within yourself. And then it's not good. You do have to keep in mind, it's not good to suppress emotions. We don't want to, you could say, hurt anybody with those emotions. But suppression becoming so bound up that you you become like the damage there might be that you become like a robot or unfeeling and uncaring. That's another tactic that people use. They said, well, I don't want to feel because feeling, I can feel, if I feel joy, I feel love, I feel happiness. What happens if the world turns around and circumstances go against me. And if I start to feel, and even, you know, I don't have the ability to feel perfectly inwardly, I'm not non-attached, I have attachments. So if I feel and I'm attached, I'm going to be pained when things go wrong. If I love somebody, well, what happens if they leave? They're going to betray me, they're going to go, and I'm ultimately going to feel pain. Well, Probably, maybe, yes. So is the answer then to completely turn ourselves off from feeling? Yeah, I think we all try that sometimes. And I think we all learn. It doesn't work that way because you just substitute one negative possibility for another. And you ultimately you have to, it's transcendence is the answer, not suppression. What avails suppression, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita? You can't suppress. You have to act and you have to do your best and you suffer the consequences. But bottling up is not going to be uh, the answer, even though subjecting yourself to the consequences of negative emotion ultimately will, you'll get yourself into trouble. But ideally, we get ourselves into trouble and we learn the lessons. And this is what we're trying to do. Now, remember something I said here, and what's the answer to this? There is a connection between ego and emo negative outward emotion, the sense of I-ness. And it's that sense of I, ego, I, I am the one experiencing this. I am the one creating these waves. I am the one that it's enjoying the, the fruits of my emotional outburst. And I'm the one that's also enjoying the conse negative consequences of that. And so this, con this so the, the answer ultimately is that we have to go beyond this ego consciousness of I-ness, the little I who's, who's enjoying this world and ultimately enjoying riding on the surface ups and downs of those waves. We get to the point where we don't get rid of that. I mean, we don't kill that eye. What we do is we transcend it. Like Master said in his poem, I, the little ego, see it like a bubble. I see, and, uh, I see myself, I now identify myself with the cosmic sea. And I see that ego as but a little bubble floating within me. So you can see that you're, you've transcended your, you, the ego still plays its role. And you know, the ego never completely dies in that way. It always exists, even in super conscious uh, nirvikalpa samadhi, it always still exists, but as a memory, it's not 
our reality, but we remember it. And but our identity has been transferred to the larger cosmic sea. And this is the ultimate answer, of course, to overcoming that the effects, the karmic effects of, of ego consciousness and of ultimately to emotions. But that's it's good to know the goal that we're after, but is it a reality for us in day to day? To some degree, yes. Master used to say, live in the self. Try to maintain that sense of self-awareness, that self-consciousness that I am acting. He said, then go out from the self to do your actions in day-to-day life. You eat, you interact, you enjoy in this world, but then always return to the self. And this is what we do when we meditate, but not just when we meditate, when we act in this world, feel yourself in your inner center. Now the, the heart center is the center of chitta. It's the center of there. And, you know, here's the center of the intellect, that sense of uh, that we project from. But this is why Master said, keep your attention here at the point between the eyebrows. But from that attention of keeping yourself there centered, you also at the same time can feel there at, you know, in between with the two in balance. And you go out from that and then interact in the world, but always keeping that sense of self that I, the cause, you know, my higher self am acting in this world. And to the degree that you don't forget that, you'll find yourself not so easily drawn out in a reactive process. Because isn't that what it, this comes, emotions come down to? It's reaction the reaction to what happens to us outside ourselves. Why do we get angry? Something happened and we just, it flares up. It's like good word flares, like a cosmic flare, it bursts into existence. And we lose our sense of balance. And it's a matter of training our sense of ba- ourselves to be in that state of inward balance at all times. But We go out, we lose ourselves, oh, come back again. And little by little, we begin to moderate those ups and downs. It doesn't go away all at once, but we learn to moderate it. We keep our tension like as if you can personalize it and think you're you're in, you're sitting on the banks of the stream with God, looking at the passage of life. And every once in a while, you know, you get hooked you know, by something, and then you come back, and God is with you. God's hooked you also, and God is drawing you back to your center. Think of it in the same way that we approach habits. Emotions are just like that. They're habitual. The habit of reacting in a certain way is the first thing is we observe it and become aware of it. We have, yes, I have this habit of reacting. I have this habit of getting angry. I have this habit of, of just emotionally reacting to this or that. If you are aware of it, that's the first step. And then you begin to learn to withdraw it. And it's like when you have a habit, you realize it's the same energy that's going out into that expression of emotional outburst we don't kill it it's like krishna says nothing dies we just direct it into a different direction and so consequently you know you know at first maybe you get angry but you don't get angry at somebody else you express your anger in some other way chop wood (laughs) or nobody's around and you give a primal scream they say you know that that therapy that somebody came up with well again it's better than venting on somebody else but it's actually the the chop wood analogy or example is actually good you get out and you do something and you express that anger in some constructive way a neutral way even if it's not constructive at least it's neutral and you're aware of it. That's it. Keeping our attention of what's going on within ourselves. And you learn not to express it this way, but I'm going to express it in a neutral or better way. And then you begin to put it into, maybe I can express that in a positive way. 
it else. Because what is, let's say, anger, for example, it's fervor. I'm fervent. So I'm getting, maybe somebody's done something wrong and maybe you have a sense of righteous anger. They shouldn't do that. It's a bad thing to do. And you get really angry at them because somebody else did something that you consider wrong. Well, there's a certain positiveness into it because you're trying to perhaps be dharmic and you want dharma to, to win. And so you, you, but you've expressed it in a wrong way. Master scolded one of his disciples who was very, very, fervent in his anger at somebody who was doing a little bit of embezzlement within the organization that he had set up. And Master said, yes, you should, you know, to bring that to, some, to attention was a good thing, but you don't have to do it angrily, you see. You don't have, and so this, you could say that any kind of fervor that expressed, uh, you could say, expressed emotionally in a negative way is something we need to control ourselves with. There was a story of Master once. He was in, I think it was when he was in Mexico. There was a student of his, a disciple of his that uh, was there. And this disciple was very fervent, you know, very devoted. And uh, it was a, a young lady. And Master kind of just asked a little question. Maybe he saw something in her karma, I don't know. But he asked her, he says, how do you feel about marriage? And she reacted, he says, she said, very, with great vigor, she says, I have given my life to God. And Master says she fairly shouted at him when she said that, I've given my life to God and I will continue to serve God alone, without a husband, without a mate, faithfully, devotedly, every year of my life until I die. Well, the <laughs> pastor was taken aback. He said, my goodness. <laughs> and then he said, he says, well, that's, you know, that's, a, he, he admired her fervent uh, uh, devotion in that way. He says, but why the emotion? Seek God, yes, but in calmness. And I think what he was probably saying is because when anybody is so fervent that they're so emotional about it, like this young lady or that fellow who got angry at the person who was a little bit crooked, when you're emotionally that way, in a sense, you're reacting to something, isn't it? There's a reaction to it. And that reaction inevitably is going to push the pendulum. And this probably you're reacting to some something inside yourself. And I think emotion traces itself to that. Why get angry at somebody else? Probably it's because you're going to see, you see a little bit of that inside yourself. And that's what you're getting angry at. You have that potential. And so how do you work that out? Is it maybe that young woman, she had some deep-seated desire to be married, and she didn't want it to be that because she was afraid of it. She had been hurt, perhaps, in the back uh, incarnations ago. There was something was probably there that she was reacting against. And it's the principle of magnetism. When you have that much magnetism in one direction, you're going to attract the circumstances for you to have to work that out. Now, so consequently, if you're really, you know, I've heard like monastic men say, you know, they're very fervent in them. I want to be take up with the monastic path with great ardor. I admire the devotion. I don't admire the emotion. And if there's emotion behind your uh, your devotion, well, then you have to watch out. So you see this expressed in people's devotional expression for God. When it becomes the devotion for God is great. And you could feel that going back to that music of Swami's. You could feel that devotion in Swami's words and in his music, but it wasn't emotional. And so lots of people, they chant Hare Krishna, Hare Ram, and they get, you know, they, they, they lose themselves in emotion. Well, emotion ultimately is but a wave. 
And when a wave rises far up, down it goes when things go wrong and something else has happened or they end up being challenged. And so this is the problem here. We want to feel that pure feeling of devotion in the heart and then gather it up. And maybe you're expressing a little outward. Obviously, if you're working and talking and interact with people, it's going to come off and you still have ego. It's going to come out a little bit. But you, yet at the same time, you're channeling that energy that's been awakened and you're instead of in your in your control, you're in control of your emotion, and then you can direct you can direct it upward. And so your fervor is to be admired. And but when you feel that fervor, stay in the in the self and then begin to develop that and direct it upward. And so this is this is uh, something to keep in mind to watch these two. Don't suppress it. And that's just so that, you know, because we make mistakes so often. And like I mentioned this already, but I want to come back. We make mistakes again and again and again through our emotions. And you just say, mm, I did it again. I'm going to work on it. And next time I'm going to do better. And you do it again, and again. But you keep at it. That's the thing. Don't be, you know, guilt against yourself uh, because you blew it again. Is That's also an emotion. Regret is an emotion. Anger, fear, all of these things, they are emotional feelings. And when you have those feelings, what happens is they take up all the space. They eat up all the oxygen, you could say. And then there's no oxygen for you'd be able to do what we need to do. So you can't withdraw from it. We have to act in this world. We have to fight uh, the battle, you could say. But our goal is to do it in calmness. And this is the element that's the antidote for emotions is calmness. Feel that calmness. That too is a feeling. It's a divine feeling. And when we go into meditation, you know, we start by feeling peace. Peace is the cessation, you could say, of disturbance. But calmness is deeper than peace. Calmness is, is that positive placement of our self in stillness that comes when we neutralize the emotional likes and dislikes of the heart. The waves become calm. Peace is somewhat temporary, transitory. It's a, it's a temporary state, but it probably is what we're going to feel first. And so you use peace as the doorway to really going into the heart and feeling the calmness of the mind and of the heart together. And it's in calmness that we overcome the waves of likes and dislikes. And when likes, and then when we overcome those likes or dislikes, or at least moderate them, then ego begins to recede a little bit. And as ego recedes, our sense of being with God as being the doer begins to come upon us. And maybe God's not the complete doer because we're ha we have a part in to play in it at first, but eventually we see that ultimately it's all God's doing. But this is a directional goal, and we don't, we don't get there in one step, but it's the direction that's more important than the actual attainment for us, certainly at this step in our spiritual path. And so keep these in mind, is, and, and is, it's a day-to-day -day journey. Call, putting ourselves, you could say, immersing ourselves in the waters of calmness. It's like a bath. Try to feel it when you meditate each day. And then you take it out and, you know, then what happens is you start being uh, bombarded, but then you come back again and again. And it's always there. If we can learn to summon it up, summon it up at the moment to the degrees that everything you know because the world is trying to pull us out of that all the time and if we can stay in that we find that then everything in life goes smoothly everything in life is uh, 
not only calm, but then we begin to experience those other aspects that are with calmness, with joy, God's presence. And that's when then we become like master, perhaps. That's our goal, is in every moment, as Swamiji used to say, even when master was laughing, doing a good joke, having something that was seemingly outward, Swami said he'd look in master's eyes and he would see that there was just depth. He was in another space altogether. There was just a depth there of calm, deep, inner stillness that was deep in there. But yet outwardly, he was engaged. He was engaged and he wasn't withdrawn. He would have fun. That's how we want to be, but not lose ourselves in the outwardness, always maintaining that stillness of being in, in the self. Joy to all of you. Joy to all of you. And if you have any questions about any of this, write them in the chat thing and chat box and or uh, give them to me and send email me and I'll come back and we'll chat more about them and answer them at a future time. God bless you and have a very nice evening and may your week go smoothly and well and May you be in a state of calm, inner joy. God be with you.